um, we've we've heard from two very courageous women um, who, who as, as some of you said, are speaking on behalf of many others in a similar situation and giving us an insight into what it feels like. And, and we very, very much appreciate both of and, and you, Elizabeth, for uh, reading out the testimony. Um, I'd like to turn now to Caroline Noakes, uh, Chair of the Women and Equalities Committee. Thank you, uh, Baroness Lister. And can I add my thanks to, to uh, Samia and to Adriana for sharing their stories with us. And there is one uh, really important takeaway that I think uh, perhaps Elizabeth articulated on behalf of Adriana very clearly, but also came through maybe not in the words that she said, but in uh, the way she said it from Somia. And that's about strength and courage. Um, and that really struck home that Adriana now has the strength and the courage that she needs, but that is so much driven by the fact that she now has status. Um, and certainly in the time that I spent as immigration minister, and it's important to reflect that I have now not been immigration minister for twice as long as I was immigration minister. Uh, and so it's uh, receding into the dim and distant past. I can remember the meetings that we had with uh, Baroness Williams, with Vicky Atkins at the time, who was uh, the minister doing the job that Rachel McLean now has, with Ed Arger from the health, I think he was at justice then, not at health, uh, and ministers across government, because this is not a problem that will be solved by the Home Office alone. And sometimes, and this is the controversial thing that I'm going to say, which could upset everybody, uh, you know, data sharing is not always bad. And it is imperative that there is data sharing with, uh, and I give it the wrong title endlessly, uh, the Ministry for Housing, Communities and Local Government, which is now levelling up communities and housing. Uh, because what the government needs to know is to understand the, the scale of the need uh, and to understand that there are women in some instances uh, stuck in limbo, dangling for 10 years. I mean, 10 years, we're not talking for a few months. We're talking about years of their lives, fighting to be able to maintain access and a relationship with their children, which perhaps uh, frightens them more than anything else that they will not be able to, to maintain that relationship. Or, you know, Samia was very clear in her case, she had to rebuild her relationship with her children. So it is important that government can act across departments. And yes, sometimes that does mean uh, sharing data, but what is very clear and what I always said as minister um, and what I say now as chair of the select committee is you have to treat the victim of domestic abuse as the victim of domestic abuse first and foremost, which requires a level of disinterest in their, uh, in their immigration status, because in the same way that Somia so perfectly articulated financial control uh, and we heard from the account that Elizabeth read to us, physical and uh, you know, absolute control over a person's uh, physical well-being. So a passport is often, way too often used as a tool of control. Uh, and that was something that I was very clear of as minister and struck that there were some categories of women who had no protection under the law whatsoever, that their status in the UK was entire. And I'm, apologies for being so terribly gendered, but I will be gendered because uh, domestic abuse is a gendered crime. So I will talk about women who were here reliant upon their partner or their husband's uh, immigration status, who potentially were here. Uh, one of the greatest injustices I always felt was students uh, who are here on tier four visas with no protection whatsoever. Um, and it used to vex me enormously that we seem to find it so difficult to put in place policies that would actually be constructive and help. Now, look, I, uh, I support the importance of the Home Office being able to evaluate the pilot. I welcome the news that the funding will continue for another year, but it is only another year. And I have seen it firsthand how long it can take to evaluate uh, policies. So that causes a level of concern causes me a level of concern that it's me here talking today, not the minister. Um, and I think that we need to have much more urgency and determination. The last time I had a conversation when I was in a position to do something was 2019. It's 2022. Uh, we need to have solutions that resolve the conundrum of how you can put a victim's uh, status as a victim 
first and make sure that they're given the support that they need and that fundamentally uh, nobody likes this bit it all comes out of cash uh, as Somia put it she wasn't aware that Southall Black Sisters did not have unlimited funds with which to support her and there is the stark reality with no recourse to public funds with no right to housing uh, it becomes incumbent upon the charity sector and it should not uh, so the data from the evaluation from the pilot is needed but it's needed quickly because this is not a problem, sadly, tragically, that is going to disappear uh, immediately. It will endure until there is a strategy that actually deals with it. I hope I have said everything that I planned. Oh no, just uh, uh, briefly, and I'm conscious that we're probably a little over time. I just wanted to talk uh, about the work that my committee is doing at the moment. So uh, sort of tangentially, not really related, uh, we're looking at discrimination in the asylum system. Now look, I appreciate we're not talking about asylum today, but what has come through in the evidence we have received incredibly clearly is the number of women in the UK who by dint of the abuse and relationship that they have been in, whether it is, uh, and I hate this term because they're at risk of honour-based violence, end up in the asylum system as opposed to the wider immigration system. Now that is problematic on many levels, not least due to the backlog and the fact that there is not enough resources in that system to process people who have valid uh, grounds to seek asylum in the UK quickly enough. Uh, and people often talk to me about various rights around that. But the thing that has struck me from the evidence that we've been given as a committee is that there are women who are victims, who are sitting effectively in limbo in an asylum application system, just waiting for an outcome. And so in the same way that we need to see uh, funding continued for those with no recourse to public funds, or better, a solution to the no recourse uh, position for victims of domestic abuse, we also need to see the asylum system properly funded so that decisions can be made within that six month target uh, and so that you don't see women dangling in limbo for, um, I would like to say months on end, and I cannot, it is for years on end. So I'm very much looking forward to the rest of the uh, event this morning. I will have to leave very promptly because we also have women in the college's questions uh, this morning. So if I disappear at high speed, apologies for that. Um, but it's been great to listen to the stories and, and to learn so much from those who have uh, been brave enough to come and talk to us this morning. Thank you, Caroline, that, that's really helpful. And I think you've made some really important points there. And um, I don't know whether there's a question relating to this women and qualities questions, but if so, it'd be great to have the issue raised there on, on the floor of the House of Commons. Uh, I'd like to turn now to Nicole Jacobs, uh, Domestic Abuse Commissioner, uh, who, as I said, has been, been such an important voice, I think, on behalf of uh, domestic abuse survivors, and in particular, those whose uh, immigration status has um, meant they've not had the support that they should have received. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. And those are very kind uh, words. And uh, I, I often feel that a bit embarrassed when I when I am said to have had this kind of voice, because I really do feel, and it really comes through with um, Samaya and, and Adriana, the, the kind of support that they've had through Lars, through South Hall Black Sisters, um, you know, really speaks for itself. And I, I view my role as commissioner is making room for more diverse voices. And I hope that that's something that I achieve, but I, and I hope it is mainly achieved by hearing from, from um, victims and survivors themselves in a greater diversity and also from these organizations who are doing incredible work um, and who are heavily relied upon as we've heard this morning. And I just can't, um, I can't stress enough the kind of funding environment that these organizations exist in and the insecurity of their own their own environment and funding and ongoing funding um, and so I will come back to that but I think it, it does work hand in hand and it and it very often mirrors the individual experiences of people um, like Samaya and Adriana in terms of insecurity and not kind of knowing how to plan for the future. Um, it's odd 
and may be predictable to say, but it's a very similar situation for some of these charities. Um, I really am pleased to be here today. It, you know, support for migrant victims is a key priority of my office. So um, I hope that comes through loud and clear. We, we work across government and kind of nationally and locally. For those of you who I haven't been able to meet yet, um, just to explain, we're an arm's length body of government. In other words, I, I am a public appointee, um, but we work kind of alongside and very cooperatively, I hope, with government on a day-to-day -day basis and always retain that kind of right and ability to have an independent voice. So um, we that's what we try to achieve, that balance in the commissioner's office. Um, and we work across all policy areas, but, um, but support for migrant victims is one of our four key priority areas. And that's primarily because um, despite the fact that we've had a lot of headway and a lot of progress in the passage of the Domestic Abuse Act, provision of support for migrant survivors was left out of that act and, um, and is still you know, a, a gaping hole in terms of the, the provision of support that we have. I am, this is going to make it sound like I have quite a glamorous job, um, but two weeks ago I was, I was hosted by the Spanish government. Um, that's very rare. Most of the time I'm on a screen like we are today, I can assure you. Um, but one of the things that, that came through very clearly there is that they have support for migrant survivors. There's no, um, there's no such phrase as no recourse to public funds for migrant survivors in Spain. And I just wanted to say that just as a comparator to say, this is the way things could be. We could choose to not place that kind of um, boundary on, on survivors of domestic abuse, victims of domestic abuse, and allow them to have full, full recourse of public funds. Other countries do that. And Spain is a great example. And one of the things we'll be looking for um, in that to achieve in some of that visit is they'll be sending over some the, the, the embassy, our UK um, embassy in Spain is going to help uh, our consulate is going to help us translate some of the documents from Spain about their provision of service for migrant survivors, how that's been evaluated, some of the data, as Caroline really rightfully talked about, um, that's needed. So I, I wanted to update you a little bit on the work that we're doing, because I, I hope that it will really have an impact. Um, like I said, it remains a huge priority for our office. Um, in order to address issue, the, the issue of support, the Home Office did create a support for migrant um, victims fund and there was a review in 2020 that was conducted um, that would gather in evidence to inform future um, decision making. And then there was the, on the back of that, the announcement for the support for migrant victims pilot, which, which as our chair has said, closes um, this week. We've seen in the domestic abuse plan today that was published or will be published today is uh, a provision of support for that scheme for a further year, which is incredibly welcome. Um, and we'll see in you know, the commitments for the publishing of the evaluation of the pilot that's been running and largely run through um, uh, South Hall Black Sisters that will be um, published in the summer. And then ministers have said that they'll take a longer term decision about future support. So that's kind of the state of the play in terms of where we are right now. And it's um, and it's very, very newly refreshed as of today, which is important. Um, one of the things I would want to point out to this um, committee is that you know, 1.4 million pounds is what's been allocated for the next year. That is the same amount of money that has been provided in, in the last year. In this year, I published a report called Safety Before Status, and I called for a much larger funding pot of 6.2 million pounds a year to be made available in the interim until we have longer term solutions. And the reason why um, I, I would say 6.2 million is that um, we need to provide and acknowledge that the funding that's been set aside so far is only for several hundred survivors. I mean, we have 
Hanana Siddiqui from South Hall Black Sisters here, and and she may want to say more about this in a few minutes. But but we know that that is a limited funding pot. It's very welcome, but we need to acknowledge that we have to ring fence more money in the interim so that we can provide greater um, support and routes to safety for migrant survivors. I've also said um, that kind of alongside that, we need to have um, for by and for organizations in general, um, black and minoritized communities, disabled survivors, LGBTQ plus survivors, the, the range of very specialized by and for services need a, a specific funding pot of you know, of I, what I've said in my report, 165 million pounds, so that we can understand how and have a plan of how to sustain these services kind of across the board. And because what happens at the local level, so much of this comes to local commissioning. And in local commissioning, there are some great examples, but by and large, most of the buy and for services often are shut out of local commissioning processes or the competition is such, or the way that things are tendered is such that they're, that, the comp that they're not commissioned at the local level. So we have to find another way strategically to fund buy and for services so that they're maintained. And as we've heard, they're some of the only places that are trusted. Um, and we need to rightfully understand what works for survivors, what works for victims, and who they will seek out and trust um, in these incredibly kind of, um, you know, difficult times and times when they've been told for years and years in some cases that no help is available, you shouldn't trust anyone. Um, and so buy and for services are that bridge and that really vital source of support. So I would encourage uh, members to look at the safety before status report. We drew on that report from two commissioned pieces of research. One was the Angelou Center um, and another was the University of Suffolk. And what we tried to do and what in the University of Suffolk work that was undertaken did was a critical appraisal um, of the migrant victims review that was conducted by government to help my office understand the evidence that was available and what further research might help to inform decision making. Um, the Angelou Center did a separate piece of, of research that looked at the pathways to support for migrant survivors and the practical barriers that exist. And they highlighted that even victims and survivors with entitlements to support, and I think this is really important for us all to acknowledge, for example, through Section 17 of the Children's Act or the DDBC, are often turned away from support. And you heard indications of that in Samaya and Adriana's testimonies today, where when when interacting with a range of frontline services, there's kind of an automatic view that you don't have recourse or there are not options for you. And that sends a, a really critically unhelpful message to people who are highly vulnerable, who, are, who have so much misinformation told to them by perpetrators. Um, and so we really have to find ways to um, map support in England and Wales to, to grapple with what's needed um, to be put in place, but also to make sure that frontline services um, who are in a position to advise have much greater understanding of, of what options are available um, for, for people in situations where, where their, their status is either uncertain or insecure, or maybe they have status and options but have never been told much about them. The report also highlighted the fear that data being shared with about immigration enforcement prevents many victims and survivors from reporting abuse and reaching out to support and public services. Um, so we can see and hear how this then exploits victims and survivors, and it is it becomes a very effective tool. Immigration abuse becomes a very effective tool of coercion and control. And so we have to think of in my office is very committed to working with government on the protocol that they've set out that they've committed to. Um, I think there should be a firewall. Um, I remain clear that that seems to be the most obvious thing to do. But in in the current situation, um, government has set out an expectation that they'll create a protocol. We will do everything that we can to make sure that that's as, as effective as possible. But I suppose the one point I'd like to make is 
in thinking about, and I hope you don't mind, Samaya, if I do this, in thinking about Samaya's situation, um, picture the difference between knowing there would be an absolute firewall and knowing that there's some sort of protocol that you may or may not fully understand um, the repercussions of. Those are two very, very different situations. And that's why I remain um, committed to the idea of a firewall. I think that that would be workable. Um, I just wanted to mention before closing um, what we're doing in the next, in, uh, next in terms of our next steps in the commissioner's office. Um, I've commissioned the London School of Economics and the o Oxford Migration Observatory to undertake further research to create a clearer picture of what the long-term pathways to support would look like. Caroline um, notes very rightfully talked about data and the need for information and data in government to be um, clearer. And I absolutely agree with that. And what we'll um, look for this research to achieve is robust estimates of the numbers of survivors with no recourse who are in need of support and the cost of improving support for this group. We're looking at different models, including a national fund of services to provide accommodation, support, and subsistence to survivors, similar to that of the support for migrant victims pilot. So having evaluation kind of running alongside into the summer is really important. But we're also looking at options that look at pot the potential for a, a special visa or, um, for migrant victims, which gives them access to public funds and extension to the DV. DDVC and DVILR. Um, this research will also provide a cost benefit analysis of providing that support against existing provision using green book, green book methodology. Um, I have assurances from the Home Office in their response to the, the safety before status report that they'll consider my recommendations um, in July and that their intention is to ensure that we have a model which allows all victims access to support regardless of their immigration status. So I will look forward to working closely with the minister in coming months for this. Um, and just a reminder to the group, um, some of the, the provision of my office in the Domestic Abuse Act, um, thinking about um, positives and po the po the, there are many positives in the DA plan, the Domestic Abuse Plan that's published today, is that my office has is, is been um, empowered with an ability to make recommendations to public bodies. So we, we have um, an ability to make recommendations to public bodies that have to be responded to within 56 days, which means these reports that we're producing have much greater um, kind of ability as, as Caroline rightfully said in terms of urgency and determination to really um, get a response a bit more quickly to make sure we're really clear what the next steps are, how recommendations can be responded to. So I hope that that's a helpful overview and I will pass back over to you, Baroness Lister. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, before opening it out generally to um, contributions, is there any, um, any, any, any parliamentarians or government officials who wish to say either to respond on anything or to ask any questions? And, um, and then we'll open it out for general questions. No one has put their hand up. So any, any general questions? I said, if you could um, use the reactions button um, and to raise your virtual hand, and that way we can um, see who wants to ask a question because you should automatically come to the top of the... Uh, I mean, perhaps while people are thinking about questions, I'd... Um, ah, Hanana Siddiqui, yeah, please go ahead. Hi. I just wanted to say, I, you were talking about numbers. We, we don't really know how many victims on non-spousal visas exist. We know a lot of victims get turned away uh, by agencies uh, because they felt they can't help them. We, est we did a rough estimate as an organization about 3,000 a year. Um, with the pilot, we're, we're really dealing with 500. So, you know, and that's 1.4 million. So obviously we need a lot more money to help a larger group. Um, and hopefully the research that's that's been done by the DAC office will give us, you know, better numbers in terms of how many victims are affected. 
Uh, Helen Salmon. Good morning, thank you. Can you hear me, sorry? <clears throat> thank you. Um, I work at Central England Law Centre in Birmingham and most of my work is with um, migrant victims of domestic abuse. And I, I spoke to the um, lady from London Met, I think, assessing the, the success of the project. It's very good news that the money is being um, continued. Um, but I looked at how many women had been referred to me who were not eligible for the DDDC over the last year. And it was more or less half as many as were. Um, and I say more or less because I usually was not able to take these women on for any further immigration help because there was just really nothing I could do further for them on it you know, in terms of their immigration status. And that's then really concerning because we don't know then what they were then able to do um, about be, being able to live. And I think the the single best thing the government could do is simply extend the DDVC to these groups and put them on that route to in, indefinite leave to remain and treat them, treat them as victims who need support and who need that security that means that they won't feel they need to go back to their abuser because they've got really very little other choice. And, and I, I do, I'm really, really happy that this, from what Nicole said, it sounds like this is being considered. I, I understood from what you said, Nicole, I think there's consideration being given either to extending this to other groups or creating some sort of new route for people who currently don't qualify. Can I just clarify, is that right? Is that is that what's under consideration? That's, well, keep in mind, I'm not a government minister. I am, I'm bringing together information for government and I, have, I do have every expectation that ministers will be highly interested in this. This is kind of the next stage of policy work my office is doing. And so we will be setting that out with the help of LSE and the London Oxford Migrant, uh, I mean, the, the LSE and the Oxford Migrant Observatory. Um, so I would hope that bringing that information together, setting out some clear options just helps to give greater clarity as to what the steps may be. So I don't, Helen, I really appreciate, and I know you've met with my office, but I, and I appreciate the work you're doing day to day, by the way, um, but I don't wanna set the expectation that that's, that's what government is currently considering. That's what I would hope that they would be considering. And it's my kind of contribution to making sure to bring that information together. Um, so I think that's that's the more accurate way to put it. But I would say that, um, you know, ministers within government have said very clearly they believe that. Um, and in fact, I think there's language in the domestic abuse plan that's published today that, that, that people should be treated as victims first. Um, and I think that this is, you know, some of these options are the only way to then treat victims first. I mean, I don't see any other way that you, you either have to create more options um, or recognize that, that that language and commitment is hollow. Um, so I think, you know, things are pointed in the right direction and I would hope that, that the report will be of, of really good help. Thanks. Th thank you, Helen. And presumably, Nicole, if there is evidence like that out there, it could be sent to your office that you might be able to draw on it in, in, in taking forward your recommendations. Yes, uh, thank you for saying that. Yes, absolutely. To my, and I'll put my um, our email in the chat so people can see it. Thanks very much. That would be great. Uh, I mean, just uh, just observing that the, the um, and, and Caroline made the point very strongly as well, that d domestic abuse victims should be treated as victim survivors of domestic abuse first. And that was said constantly during the passage of the domestic abuse bill in the House of Lords, but it didn't carry any weight when it came to trying to get the kind of reforms that we've been talking about today um, on, in the bill. But still, uh, we can but hope, and it is important that that keeps being said. Mohammed Shazad. Yeah, hi. <clears throat> Sorry, I got a bit of a cough, so um, bear with me. Um, yeah, I think Nicole answered some of the question, uh, and Helen asked the question around the DDV concession. So I've worked with families with no recourse to public funds for the Children's Society for since 2008. We specifically work with families and, and the project was set up to work with families with, who have no recourse. And one of the things that I found over the 
the years that I've been working is that people who are who have regular regular status or undocumented who go through domestic abuse and domestic violence who don't have a route in for um, when it comes to sort of uh, uh, sorting out their status. So one of the things sort of I wanted to ask was if if part of the pilot scheme or part of the work that, or part of the stuff that you're doing, are we looking at getting sort of DDB concessions for people who have got who are undocumented who have irregular status? I suppose that's kind of answered in the last question, really. I don't know if anyone wants to add anything on that. I mean, the only reason I ask is I think it's the only way, really, um, from my experience, it's quite essential to be able to do that and put that in for families. And one of the other things that I find is it's the speed as well that needs to be sort of um, looked at as well in regards to these applications. And I, and I know that's one of the biggest things that the Home Office have been looking at for a while. But the longer it takes, the more people are put through, through further trauma. <laughs> Helen wanted to come back in, but I just want to make sure that anyone who hasn't spoken doesn't want to come in. And if not, then Helen and then uh, Hanana afterwards. Thank you. Sorry to speak again. Um, I did just want to add in to the groups that we've talked about already um, that we should consider the position of uh, family members of the EEA nationals who have pre-settled status because although they don't strictly have the NRPF restriction written on their ID cards they effectively have it in that they're only able to access universal credit through rights derived um, from their husband usually and so they're prevented from divorcing and they're still reliant on that husband continuing to exercise treaty rights in the UK and himself choosing not to divorce them so it's a very precarious situation mm -hmm. and sometimes it's a little it's not necessarily understood that that's going on because they don't have that that stamp on the card that makes it obvious that there's a quasi NRP of condition being applied um, and this itself this is another group I think that would benefit from the DDV being extended um, along with the people who are dependents of work permit holders students and people who don't have any status at the moment who are being trapped still in relationships um, but it's just to add that sorry yeah. thank you no, no, thank you Helen that's helpful uh, Hannah, and then is Ava or Ava, Ava, uh, and then we'll, we'll, I'll ask the panel to any any final reflection before we finish. Sorry. Um. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, we've been campaigning to extend the DDB concession uh, to to all categories of visas, including undocumented uh, victims. And, you know, there has been resistance from the government, even though they do acknowledge the need to provide safety and therefore introduce the pilot. Um, I think the problem is going to be is about whether or not they get the right to settlement. Um, you know, the DDV concession has been working very well. So that's why we wanted to continue. Um, it does. I mean, it's only for three months. So we do want to extend it to six months because all our research has shown that that has a better outcome. Um, but in terms of settlement is where the problem is going to be, whether or not they get the right to settle. And some victims may not come forward if they don't get the right to settle as well. So, so if you're undocumented, you, you may feel that you'll get deported anyway, even if you get help for a short period. So I think the two things is, you know, we don't want to separate the two things because on the DDB concession, you do get the right to settle. But the government is saying, well, these, you know, those who get DDV concession is, is those on spousal visas who came into the UK with the expectation that they would be able to settle. Um, and I, we don't agree with how they're defining the right, you know, the expectation to settle, because a lot of visas does do include the expectation to right to settle. Um, but, but I think that then that is going to be the big problem. Um, so we may get a reform that is limited to just providing support, but not providing the right to settlement. And I, I don't think you can separate the two. So that's going to be the battleground, I think. Hi, it's Eva. Yeah, um, thank you. Just a couple of points in terms of um, 
have any consideration been given around domestic servitude uh, in the context of uh, modern slavery um, and to what extent you know victims of uh, domestic violence can benefit from some of the provision available to victims of modern slavery under the NRN uh, provision at least in the meantime uh, well well you know the lack of support may be uh, they may be facing lack of support and just building on the previous point around um, family members of EU nationals um, so if you see up to uh, pretty much last year, uh, most of the family members of EU nationals were non-EU nationals. And obviously with the with Brexit, we will have EU nationals who are family members of EU nationals. And I think we already had a lot of services misunderstanding of immigration status um, of uh, individuals who are coming forward. And obviously that's another complexity that I come, it's coming in because we're going to have EU nationals who don't really have status on their own, but relying on family members who have settled or pre-settled status based on their own rights. So I think there needs to be much more training um, given to, uh, to frontline staff, uh, basically to understand all this different complexity of different immigration statuses, uh, because obviously that will then um, inform what support is available for people currently. And obviously we're talking about the the kind of uh, you know further steps and further support, but actually in you know, a lot of things that are happening at the moment, you know services don't really fully understand what's available. Um, so I think you know much from from my perspective, I think much more it's needed to to support services to provide uh, uh, appropriate advice and, and, and signposting to, uh, to to victims of modern uh, you know victim of domestic violence. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I did ask uh, panel members now. To reflect on those questions and any other points they may want to make. I think Caroline, I'll ask Caroline to go first because I think you've got to rush off to the questions. So, um, thank you, Ruth. And and the only reflection that I would really like to make is that I think this point about um, the spouses of EU citizens with settled and pre-settled status is hugely relevant and hugely problematic. Um, that was clearly something that was, was bubbling along uh, over the last few years. And of course, now with the settled status scheme all but effectively closed, I, I know from my constituency experience that we are still having cases of people who have, for whatever reason have not applied uh, popping up, but they're very few and far between. And it's incredibly difficult to convince the Home Office now that those people are entitled to settled status. But you know, these, these are all factors that, um, ministers should really have been here to listen to and indeed to address. Good point. Um, Sophia, anything you'd like to say uh, in conclusion? I beg your pardon, I can't hear. I think there was... I just wondered if, if there's anything you wanted to say um, yes. from what you've heard. Yes, I wanted to say that had the help been available. So if there was a remedy to the solution, like a temporary visa granted to me, uh, it would have been easier for me to get on and be easy to reunite with my children. Um, like it did take me three years to reunite with them. And but had it not been for that restriction, I would have been able to access support sooner, would have been reunited with my children sooner, and been less at risk of abuse and hardships. So this entirely was due to the policies of Home Office, and they really need to look into it because it's of no, no good. Like, I believe the no recourse to public fund is a cruel condition which denies so many women like me, equal chance of safety and leaving us vulnerable to our perpetrators. Thank you. And the cruel condition is a very good way of summing it up, I think. Uh, thank you for that. And finally, Nicole, anything that you want to say in response to what you've heard? I, um, I appreciate the opportunity to, to be here on the panel. I think um, Samia, gives us very good last words to reflect on in terms of our shared our shared interests to make this 
much, much easier for people in, in really dire circumstances to get the support that they need. And I would just say to other members on the call, I can see in the chat, there's so much expertise here. Just to, um, if you haven't already, please reach out to our office. We're really putting a lot of effort into this um, report for the summer. And if you are thinking about information you may have or things, discussions you'd like to have, I think we would really welcome your expertise. So that's a, just a, a last plea from me. Um, and obviously, thank you very much, um, you know, Baroness Lister for having and hosting this event and, and raising these issues. It's really important um, that we keep the pressure um, to do better and to straighten these things out in the interim, but also in the longer term. So thank you very much for the opportunity. No, thank you, and thank you to all the panel members, uh, in particular those speaking from experience, because I think we learned so much from that. Thank you. Thank you to everybody who's come along. Uh, thank you to the RAMP team for organising it. I think, I mean, one sort of message and, and, that, and, and that Nicole was emphasising at the end is we need to keep up the pressure. Um, I, I was slightly anxious when Caroline said that it can, as a, from her ministerial experience, it can take an awfully long time to evaluate projects. Um, and we've heard how the money available in, for the pilot is insufficient. So we need to keep up the pressure that this evaluation shouldn't, you know, the, 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 the urgency that somebody spoke about earlier, we, we need that sense of urgency. It is urgent. <clears throat> Um, in terms of what's happening to to women now and will be over the coming months. Um, so anything that we can do as parliamentarians in terms of asking questions and so forth, uh, please do, those of you who are working on the ground, those of you in the um, Domestic Abuse Commissioner's Office, please keep in touch with us, uh, keep in touch with the APPG uh, and we will do what we can to, to maintain that pressure. But again, thank you very much, everybody. I think it's been a really, really illuminating um, meeting uh, and it just reinforces our, our sense of, uh, yeah, a sense of urgency and the need to take more effective action. So thank you very much, everybody. Goodbye and have a good day. <laughs>